All right. I would like to first welcome all the beautiful listeners to Unlock the People podcast with Static G and myself, Sinbad. We are here to guide you on a journey of unlocking ourselves and ultimately the world. But before we get real started, Static here is going to run through what to expect on this podcast journey. Absolutely. Thanks for the introduction, Sinbad. Uh, My name is Static G. This podcast was created to do exactly what the title says. We are trying to unlock the people and hopefully save the world. (laughs) My purpose of this podcast is to help people like me, people who feel alone, people who maybe feel helpless, trapped, lost, maybe uh, break you out of that motherfucking cage and set you free. You know what I'm saying? So I have experience with this because I'm doing it right now. Uh, with myself and with others i've gone through this shit. life is hard it is not easy it sucks sometimes uh you know but it's a lifelong journey and i'm not gonna act like i have all the answers i'm not gonna um pretend i know everything but i've learned a lot and i hope i can share my experience and that it can help y'all find some answers for yourself you know what i'm saying so um the journey starts within and i'm hoping hoping that maybe by listening you'll feel less alone maybe more empowered to start your own journey to self-discovery and you know connecting with the the world and the universe and really seeing the next level uh the more i'm going to share about how i unlocked myself i'm hoping you guys can do the same and i got my co-host sinbad with me the watcher the witness the audience and he's here with me and he's here with you look forward to being here with both you static as well as the wonderful listeners at home so now that the intro is done let's start this journey uh the so you wanted to give some background uh was the first segment yeah basically i'm gonna the podcast is gonna be a lot of things uh we're gonna go over my history we're gonna dive into some real shit uh heavy situations so if you're here listening trying to unlock yourself i encourage you to dive deep and it might hurt a little bit you might feel like you're drowning uh you might feel like it cuts deep but you might learn something and i think that's one of the most important things i could do here is just help show you the way um who am i I am an entrepreneur, artist, philanthropist, influencer, motivator. Uh, I'm a lot of things, but without saying too much, uh, my childhood was pretty rough. It kind of helped shape me into like an observer, a rebel, risk taker. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So six since 15, I adopted the name Static. Uh, I started making music, and that kind of felt like my calling. Um, eventually, I started becoming a full fledged musician. And I got the urge in 2011 to kind of push me to follow the music more professionally. And uh, it felt like it was going against the grain, but I listened. And in 2014, I got like a list of album titles, right? And it gave me the albums from Slightly Sober, The Bad Guy, All Out of Normal, Terrorist, Intelligent Design, Killer Be Killed, all the way to Gene Therapy with a date that was December 2nd, 2021. And now these titles spelled out the name Static. Yeah, they spelled out the name Static G. So I changed my name to Static G. <laughs> and, and that was in 2014, after I had already released my first album. Um, so after I changed my name, I went on my path. Static G kind of served as like my ego. It served as a protector, a shield. Static G was willing to do this shit that Derek Jensen wasn't willing to do. So Static G is going to go out there and stand up against the haters, fight the bullies, let everybody talk their shit. And he's really going to keep fighting for what's right. And that's the important thing to remember about me is that I am a rebel and I do definitely uh, go against the grain. You might see me in some lights as the villain, but the truth is I'm the good guy fighting for the people who don't have a voice is how I've always seen myself. Um, so at the time I didn't believe it was much of a mission from God, more as a calling to my music. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Yeah. So it was crazy, but I manifested my wildest dreams, bro. Like my wildest dreams and my worst nightmares. And this, this hero journey, it brought me all over the place. You know, I actually traveled America. I've been all over to every state. I've, uh, played my music there. I made a hundred grand in stocks. I made, Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in music as an entrepreneur with no schooling, no background, no, no nothing like that, no clubs or anything. And I even made a million dollars in crypto when I first started trying to learn it. I've just been really blessed with knowledge and a lot of luck. (laughs) And would you say a lot of that started manifesting on this unlocked journey of yours? Yes, definitely. And because I, before I had a moment with God where I, uh, I was raised Christian, but I let go of me and God. I felt like I was atheist. I felt like it wasn't real. We'll get into all that kind of stuff. But I tapped into the universe at the same time and learned the keys of the universe, the laws of the universe and started manifesting. And this happened in like 2011 where I really started tapping in and it started happening. (laughs) Like I really, I made my dreams come true. And that was the cool thing. And that's how I knew the powers that I had within myself. Um, What I didn't know 
was that it was actually the powers um, of God and that these actual spiritual encounters and spiritual um, experiences were tied into my real life, my physical life, and also my emotional stuff going on. So it really helped me tie everything together because I feel like our purpose has been lost upon us, man. And I've specifically been dragged through the fire to save people, to reach people, because you can't save them when you're out of it. You got to go in there like a fireman. And I feel like that's what I am. So uh, I felt like my purpose is to translate the word and teach it to people who can't understand, to help the lost and the broken find their way. And this is my crazy life. During my travels, I have actually walked the path. And along the way, I met Sinbad, who joined my journey to help me complete the mission to unlock the people. Yeah, I'm very glad to be on this journey. Uh, I myself had some similar beats, although it was a lot later in life. I didn't start manifesting this unlock journey till, you know, little under a year ago, about the time I turned 30, because uh, I walked the path that was prescribed to me, that was, you know, installed into me and listened to that very much. And it wasn't until that I started trusting into my inner energies that, yeah, some crazy manifestations happened. I wound up in Longmont and met Static G and like we started sharing and going like, oh, like, you know, he's an artist, he's a videographer. I'm this, you know, path of creating myself as a videographer. Oh, let's make, manifest this podcast. We're both doing healing journeys and adventuring and all this artistry that we wish to share with the world. So I'm very glad to be here in our wonderful podcast space. So I think it's time to officially get started because uh, you have a prompt for us for our inaugural episode. Yes. Well, um, the truth is that we are going to get into my story. And every time I tell my story, we're going to go through it and it's going to unlock certain parts of my journey, which I feel like should relate to some of y'all's journey. Because believe it or not, I feel like we all have our own story, but we can relate to each other a lot. I feel like a lot of us have gone down similar paths, if not the same, definitely similar, or if not different enough that we can learn from each other in those ways, you know? So sharing is one of the most powerful ways to heal. Um, I, in my healing journey, the biggest elements for me that have, of this manifestation was when I started sharing my healing journey or just sharing my love energies, what, whatever was about me that I, you know, before was ashamed about thought, Oh, this is never worth anything. I got to listen to, you know, the world around me of what I should do. When I started going, you know, let me give my inner voices, my inner energies a shot and then started sharing those the world. Then yeah, crazy manifestations started happening. People I would meet, places I would go, things that would inspire. And I'm, you know, excited that we can hopefully share in this space and inspire that in others. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, because I've been through so much, you'll hear through my story, you'll hear how much different things I've been through. Um, and that's why I relate to so many people. It doesn't matter what your skin color is, what gender you are, what your experience is in life. I generally can relate to it. I have a lot of empathy and it's because of my experience that I feel comfortable sharing and I feel comfortable enough saying in confidence that I think I can help you, you know, you and the viewers at home uh, and everyone in the world, hopefully. Yeah, that's the goal. So let's get to the second part of this podcast, which is going to be the actual story, story of Static G, story of Derek Jensen, Static Jesus, the beginning, the chapter beginning. one. Yeah. And I believe we have the title for that trailer trash. Yes, trailer trash. So, you know, drop us into that space. Where do you want to start us in chapter one trailer trash? Well, I'll tell the truth, man. I'm just going to tell my whole story as we go. Um, let's let's uh, kill the music for this part. All right, let's get some serious mode. Yeah. So when I, when I tell my story, I like to just be honest, kind of keep it in a sectional area. So I'm going to start out right at zero, okay? All right. I was born in Alaska. A lot of people don't know that. Born in Fairbanks, Alaska, middle of nowhere, uh, you know, and it's like super icy out there is what I hear. <laughs> That's what you hear. You didn't experience that. So I was born and I moved right to Wyoming. My family oh. did. So so what? Only there like a year. Yeah, maybe. And not even that. I guess Alaska wasn't middle of nowhere enough. They were like, where is it? Where in America could we go that is in the middle of nowhere? So they found the Wild West, Wyoming, and moved me to Casper. And that's where I started my story. All right. Well, let's hear that story. Well, um, you know, I, my family was pretty poor. We definitely had no money. Um, we were in the poorest school as well. I was on free lunches. Uh, I never let that bother me too much, except for when I was like hanging out with other kids and I'd see that their families had Playstations or Nintendos and action figures and robots and stuff. And, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot. 
um, we had good Christmases, you know, and we had bad ones. It's just, it just depended on what we could do at the time. I never held it against my family or my mom. I never was like angry about being broke. I was just kind of cool with it, to be honest. Like, I mean, it sounds like you have some pretty heavy feelings about that though, regardless. I think deep down, like if you look at the fact how obsessed I am with, with success and healing and finance and being comfortable, I think you're right. Like I haven't even thought about that, but like, yeah, I mean, being poor really drove me to have everything. My daughter wouldn't even know that her dad came from like a family that had to struggle to survive. And you know, all me and my mom, she pulled her shit together. My brother, he pulled his shit together. I pulled my shit together. We did not come from a family that had their shit all together. You know, even my grandparents, they had their shit, they made a business, but they did it on their own. And then my mom had to do it on her own and I had to do it on my own. It was never like a lot of families you know, you hear about they have inheritance or generational wealth. Like, no, we start at zero, <laughs> every baby. And, you know, I like that though, because I feel like I would have not had the same experience I have had if I was raised with money. Did you support each other in those entrepreneurial endeavors? Because you said each of you did it on their own, but was there at least some, you know, collaboration with each other? I'll be honest, man, we're too broke to help each other. What we do is we offer emotional support, <laughs> moral support. My family never once said, don't go chase your dreams. They're all like, go get it. You got this, which is more than money sometimes. That's extremely important. Um, I didn't have a lot of that growing up. So the fact that like you did, like I, mm -hmm. I can see that that's like helped you a lot and just be in awe of that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, you know, that said, I did, I was raised in like a Christian family you know really very christian my grandpa he was like that super christian guy that uh really turns people away from christianity in the sense like my uncle was gay so that wasn't cool with him uh, my mom was like you know this teenage rebel who wanted to listen to madonna and you know she was having sex young had her baby at like 16 years old or 17. um that was me and um so just all together my grandpa was not happy with the state of my family <laughs> and where we were going. So he tried to beat Christianity into everybody. And it just basically scared my uncle off to Arizona. He was like, screw this. My mom was basically like, you know, she loves her dad. I love my grandpa. And he, I'm not talking shit on my family. I'm just going to be honest. And no, I mean, speak your truth. Yeah. And the thing is, like, he came around in the end before he passed away. Uh, rest in peace. And he came around and he made his amends. You know, he, he made everything right. But at this point, he had been, you know, beaten Christianity into us and basically beat it out of us. <laughs> some, some wounds came from that, it sounds like. Uh, and yeah, totally. And, you know, as much as I, it, as a kid, believed in like the Christian version of God, which is like the, the guy in the sky and the devil with the horns and the, that kind of thing, you know, which was what I believed at the time. But as I got older, I slowly started to see and feel like that was um, not the full truth or like it was a lie. I felt like it was a trick to make obedient humans. And like, I think every human comes across that path in their life where they're like, are you trying to trick me into doing stuff and being afraid of stuff? <laughs> you know? Yeah, as, as we get older, we can reflect. But when you're a child, like, I mean, the, you kind of take the word of adults pretty heavily. You do, yeah. And that was kind of like, you know, what inspired the initial part of this conversation is like the childhood element, like the weight of burdens. Um, I know there were some other elements from your child that you were looking to share as well. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I grew up Christian and I did believe in God. I did. I've always had this feeling like there's a God. I won't lie. Like the reason I turned away was because I felt betrayed by God because I was like, why am I so poor? And like growing up, I was actually really smart, bro. And I, I had a, I tested in the top 98 percentile in second grade. So I was in the poor school, the poor kid in the middle of nowhere, somehow smarter than 98% of America at the time, <laughs> you know, which was a fucking cool. It felt good because as a poor kid, that's all I had, dude. Like that was all I had was my intelligence. So my body, my mind, uh, you know, and then if you're looking at my family life, like my dad was in prison, he was, he was, a uh, he was a good dude. He's always writing us letters, really active as far as trying, you know, but just fucking up, man. He was on his own journey. <laughs> and like now he's a man of God. He has a whole you know, a whole family. I have brothers and sisters. But back then he was on his crusade. You know, we all run through the fire, I think, you know, in our own way. And he definitely did his. Uh, my mom, she was always working. She was a good person, really worked hard. But she was just always taking care of shitty dudes who would try to beat on her. Um, it left me and my brother in just this weird situation where it's like you're two kids and your mom's getting beat up. And normally, you know, we would, we would, I would almost casually walk out the door and be like, Hey, get off my mom, mom, quit being crazy, brother, get back in your room. You know, started having to be the adults at age eight. Yeah, basically. 
And, you know, that does that does take a toll on you as a kid. I felt like I didn't have much of a childhood. I was always trying to make sure everybody was OK. Right. And, um, you know, it really sucks because there was one time when my brother came and he was like me, my mom was getting choked out outside <clears throat> and he, she, my stepdad was like beating on her and shit. And my brother was looking at me like, yo, we got to go help her. And it was the first time I was ever like scared. I was like, dude, I don't, he's like going to fuck us up. You know what I'm saying? I just remember having this feeling and I froze and it was the first time I ever felt like a bitch. <laughs> it was the first time I didn't know what to do. And it was the first time my brother saw that I didn't know what to do. And I just remember him walking right out and he just kind of took off. You know what I'm saying? And went after her. And then I heard it. And this is the last, I, this is the only time I remember blacking out as a kid, but he, uh, I heard my brother scream, get off her. Right. And I froze and I just stopped right there. Apparently, my brother tells me this is what happened. I went out there, grabbed a steak knife, and I got dude in his, I looked dude in his eyes, and I said, if you don't get off my mom, I'm going to cut you ear to ear. <laughs> As a little kid. That's right? a pretty intense statement for an eight-year-old to make. Right. I think that's pretty crazy. But, you know, and that would set the tone for my life, which is that I had to be the craziest one in the room. You felt like you had to be something? I had to be the one to control shit. And that didn't matter if the guy was bigger than me, scarier, had more money, if he was supposed to be my stepdad or something. Like, if you're a cop, it doesn't matter. A teacher. At any point, no authority mattered to me because I'm the authority. Right? Because that's how I felt. That's a immense burden. Yeah. Again, like I, it reminds me of like the Greek stories of like Atlas, like you know, carrying the world on your shoulders. Totally, and that can break you. And to do that so young, like I, I resonate. I've had similar experiences of you know, not into like the violence way, but very much into like having to figure out and carry shit at a very young age, being robbed of a childhood, not having the room to just explore yourself and feel who you are on your own terms. One hundred percent. And I will admit, um, my mom, like I said, my grandpa kind of tried to beat them into being this type of person. And my mom would always allow me to be myself. So as a kid, I really looked up to Dragon Ball Z characters, Mortal Kombat characters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a big fan could, of Dragon Ball and Mortal Kombat myself. Yeah. People who could whoop some ass, you know, people who could defend their Earth realm and defend their planet. And that's the kind of guys I wanted to be like as a kid. So I, I really got into that. And I would draw like. Uh, severed heads on my homework, like because of you know fatalities. Yep. And my mom let me play. finish him. Yeah, in some ways, people might say that's bad parenting. I look at it as like you know it's not bad because I got to discover myself in all my darkness and all my light. And yep. you know you're gonna choose who you are in the end, regardless. And I've always chose light, but that doesn't mean I don't like to see a head get knocked off playing a video game or drive into a car and jack it. You know, and just do some fun stuff that you can't really do in real life. You know, it's a form of escape, which is a form of how you handle some childhood trauma. <laughs> yeah, escape is a is a tricky double-edged sword. In yeah. small doses, in understandable ways, it can be helped. But when we start living in an escapisms and we start going, God, it's like, I'm just getting through the day to go to my escapes, you know, you're kind of losing out on life. Yeah. And at least for difficulties in my nature, it was a lot of it came to, I just didn't know who I was. Again, coming back to, I didn't get the chance to discover that as a kid. And that was probably one of the biggest things i carried with such a burden for such a large percentage of my life and mm -hmm. so i'm glad we're you know hopefully manifesting that to be like hey really find what you love about yourself yeah the key the key to uh, i'll just go ahead and spoil the ending the key to life and everything is love <laughs> yep. that's that's actually the truth self-love yep. love for others love for all things. yeah and i think in that order too first you have to love yourself yeah it's before you can start loving others before you can then start loving the world because if you don't love yourself like you are the foundation of the mm -hmm. life you're experiencing yeah, you it's, are the temple just, yeah just like if you're building a building it's like if the foundation's cracked or moldy or something and you build stuff on top of it well it's going to cave in sooner or later yeah. So you got to love yourself first and you have to give yourself time to discover that because it's a long journey. It really is. <laughs> it really is. And, um, you know, as far as my journey when I was young, you know, my mom really supported me creatively. She let me kind of be myself. She never really once she would question me. She'd be like, what the fuck is this you're drawing here? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. You know, this is what it is. And she's like, all right. But that's good engagement. Like yeah. having that question, having that witness is important. Um, 
I had a lot of opposite experience. I had a lot of, it was checked in on what are my results in school or the results, but not so much like, hey, what do you like doing? It's like, how do you feel? Yeah, no, it, the priority was always school, you know, health and wellness, like the things that the world said mattered. Like for if you're fucking up there, you don't have time to explore yourself. You got to yeah. fix the things that society wants. And that's, that was my burden to carry. So, yeah. And because, you know, I think my, my grandpa in his way of carrying his family is kind of similar to how your family probably carried you in a way, which is like, you're down this path and this is who you are and this is what you be. Yep. You probably resist a lot less. Uh, me, I resisted pretty much every path <laughs> that I was on, uh, after, after elementary at the first, I was definitely of the, uh, I want to go to school. I want to be the smartest. I want to be successful. I want to be an astronaut. I want to <laughs> do things, you know, and I want to, but the cool thing is my mom gave me that chance. She's like, all right, you want to try basketball? You want to go to karate? Uh, want to do this? You go to art class. You know, she was really supportive and just like, and, and she had to be though because she was always working she's a single mom taking care of douchebags who beat on her and she's paying all the bills and she's got two kids you know she kind of got to get me in sports give me something to do so she can go to work right but but it was really cool because it allowed me to say hey i don't fucking like sports yeah. <laughs> i'm not a man's that was in the 90s where you're supposed to be a man and i'm supposed to like cars i'm supposed to like sports i'm supposed to do all these things that I absolutely didn't like. I was like, I'd rather sit in my, you know, room and draw a picture or, you know, sit outside and, you know, play my Game Boy and just shit like that. Like yep. I was that nowadays that's more normal. Back then wasn't so normal. Yeah, I mean, but giving the breath to explore that like I usually got the the commitment piece. Um even if there weren't like my choices. So like when you brought up sports, that reminded me that you know, earlier in my youth, I was put into like a youth soccer league. I didn't have any interest in soccer. It wasn't anything like I prompted my parents to do, but they were just like, nope, you're going to do this. And even though I didn't like it, like, well, this was your commitment. So you got to see it through to the end. So yeah. I was suffering. It was miserable. And but I was just like, I guess I got to do this anyway. I did have that similar experience in the sense that she like gave me these things and said, go do it. But at the same time, uh, there was an experience in football where I was like, I, I caught the ball the first time ever. I was always the benched kid. I wasn't that good oh, at sports. <laughs> so so they, they threw the ball at me once and I jump up, I catch it. It was like, yes, I got it in the air. And then one kid hits me in the head. Another kid hits me in the legs. And I basically do like a Ooh, midair somersault. Boom! Land on my neck. Ooh. I'm surprised I'm not paralyzed because that shit hurt. <laughs> but I, was, I woke up and I'm like, mom, I'm done with football. Football sucks. <laughs> this is yep. not for me. I'm going to go draw some pictures. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the fact that she allowed that is pretty cool. My mom, um, you know, I, I've, I've been known for talking shit on my mom and my music, um, you know, and it hurts her feelings. And I've made a really big point talking about my life in the future that I make a point to my friends and fans and family that are listening to this, that I'm in no way ever talking shit on anybody in my family um, when I discuss my past. But I am going to be honest. So if yep. something hurts your feelings, I'm sorry. But I'm also going to talk about the good yeah. things you did too. Two you know? things can be truth at the same time. You know, it can be both true that hey, like I, you love your family, and this is not talking shit. But it also can be true that hey, there's some pain from back then that I don't feel got seen, I don't feel got witnessed, and this is my way of sharing it. Yeah, and I think in order for people to unlock themselves, they're going to be looking at like why things didn't work out with their boyfriend or girlfriend. They're going to be looking at things like why did my job fire me or, you know, why am I always fucking miserable and unhappy? The truth is you have to look at the root. Yeah. What is really causing these issues? And for me, I always thought it was like, you know, I thought I healed from my childhood. I was good and, I, you know, everything was cool. Um, and then I'd have issues in my relationships or something and I was trapped in a pattern. And through these patterns, I was able to say, oh, my God, this goes back to being a kid, yep. you know, which we'll get back and we'll get into this um, more in the second and the third part of this podcast um, where we have talk about childhood trauma and how it shapes us. But um, I'll kind of finish up my story real quick so we can get there. But so I tried sports, you know, I was actually bullied in school, but I was like the quiet kid that everybody kind of felt bad for. Um, I was like the Kenny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you started telling your story and I was like, oh, in the trailer, but the cool kid, but also kind of the ostracized kid that got picked on like by parties. Like, oh, weirdly, it reminds you of Kenny from South Park. Yeah, okay. I didn't want to bring that up. So I'm glad you did. Yeah, that was definitely me. I was definitely Kenny. Yeah, always related. Yeah. To, to be fair, though, Kenny was my favorite character. Mine too. And you know what? He's always the guy who got killed. And that's me too. I'm yep. the guy that they're always trying to kill him and then has some spiritual epiphany and has a big movie where he's a hero. So I'm like, I could fuck with Kenny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, he 
he was the best superhero. You know, he apparently, I mean, like, he was just always my favorite character. Yeah, He's man. the coolest kid. Poor, poor in finance, rich in spirit. Yep. And if you saw, like, the future episodes, eventually he becomes, like, rich and famous and, like, a big scientist or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's kind of, like, this hero's journey. I feel like if you have money, you almost have a harder spiritual journey. Money can be a powerful tool or a big burden. It just depends on if your world is serviced by you having it. At least my observation. But yeah. you've uh, sounds like you've had a lot of money experience. But that might be a future episode, of a future podcast. Yeah, it, it, the finances, emotions, spirituality. These these themes are going to ring throughout every episode. But there will be specific episodes that touch on yeah. each, these subjects. But yeah, so you know, I was bullied, but I never really cared because I would fight back. Uh -huh. I didn't give a fuck. I'm like, dude, if you're going to hit me, I'm going to hit you back. My mom told me never swing first, but always swing back. Yep. <laughs> and I rode that to the grave. Well, I'm, I guess I'm alive, but. Yeah, I was given a similar speech by my mother, but I I never really engaged. Like I, I was less physically bullied and I was more socially distanced. It was more like I was, you know, kept at arm's length. I was never invited. I was just like, oh, he's the weird kid who's going to sit alone. I was you know, the fat kid growing up. That was an easy target for bullying. Mm -hmm. And yep. You know, separation, uh, especially, you know, falling later in life. But even in the early ages, it's like, ah, oh, wow, I'm just, I don't have a place here. Don't have friends. Don't feel good being here. Yeah, I feel that. So I think the the main thing is like looking back, seeing what, so when we're talking about unlocking you, there's always two sides to it, I feel like. Number one, you got to look at the trauma side and what fucked you up? What threw you off your course? Where did the devil get into your life and say, I'm going to twist your direction and yep. see if you say okay i'm going this way or if you go back to where you're supposed to go yeah and um you know and also the other side is to say what are my blessings what are the things that i was good at what was my heart calling me to what was my heart song so to speak like yeah you know what I'm that's that's a phrase i i adopted from my spiritual community that i i very much live by is like in your innerest heart there's some resonance you have with something in the world that you, a lot of times, like you'll see it in artists a lot. You know, the people that can play an instrument for days straight and just not stop. It's like, that's their heart song. Sometimes it's something else, but yeah, it's like, it, it can be a big thing. Like looking, where did all this start? You know, where was, you know, did you have this inspirational gift in a youth that you didn't follow because something told you a darkness, the devil, whatever to, Oh, you got hurt. You should go do this now. And you know, yep. And for me, this is where my my path came into play is so I tried everything I was I actually like fighting I liked uh, Taekwondo that uh, Dragon Ball Mortal Kombat inspiration. Yep, yep. Yep. So I actually I rose through the belts too fast. It mm -hmm. pissed parents off and they they, they the actual uh, my trainer held me back at that point was like, sorry, man, I can't keep ranking you up. You can train with the black belts, but you're stuck at this belt now. And I was like, that's fucked up. Fuck karate. Fuck Taekwondo. I left over that. But, you know, I felt pretty good knowing, okay, I'm I'm working with the black belts. Okay, and I like to fight. I like to stand up for myself, discipline. I don't like sports. Leave that shit over there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But what else could there be? So I got this call, um, all the kids did, to go into a choir. And they're like, yo, um, everybody try out. And at this time, I didn't know I could sing or anything like that. I was just like, I'm going to try because I don't know what I'm good at and I don't know who I am and I don't have money, so I might as well have skills. So, so I went to the choir and I was like, okay. I sang, I think they had to sing the American anthem and I sang my ass off. And then I was sitting in school and as I told you, I'm the quiet kid, the bullied kid. Everybody feels bad, picks on me, but also kind of leaves me alone. So over the big speakers and shit, everybody's like, okay, we have an announcement to make. Uh, Derek Jensen from second grade, you've been accepted into the children's chorale choir. And they were waiting for other people. And then nobody else's name in second grade. And everybody just looks back at me like, Derek Jensen, that kid, quite weird. He can sing. And I just could see all their faces. And it was almost like a bit. I'm, I met a, a friend from grade school who actually told me later, she was jealous. She was like, yo, I wanted to get picked and I could feel that shit. Cause I was like, I didn't even want to get picked. I just wanted to see if I could do it. <laughs> you know, here I'm getting picked and now everybody's looking at me funny. So that was my first calling like, okay, music, you're good at music, you know? And I was also good at drawing. I used to draw a lot back then, but back then I didn't really sing. I didn't know how, um, this was supposed to train me. And then I was good at drawing 
And um, so when I went to the choir, there was the unfortunate situation where my family was too poor. <laughs> the, the recurring theme from my childhood, your family's too broke, you can't do it, go do what you're supposed to do. You I, uh, I hear a lot of recurring themes from your child. They're like, yeah, you have this like all too like beautiful talents that the world around you is not letting you manifest for one reason or another, whether it's you know the family situation, whether it's the school situation or like whoever's in charge, it's like, ah, uh, we Hard don't, mode. yeah. <laughs> It's like, oh, we don't have a place for you. Like you're, you're not in frequency with all the other kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and so you know, I tried the, uh, I tried the the choir thing, and I loved it because they had free Oreos, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's an Oreo city, yeah, free little treats, you know. And I loved it. And then after like four or five um, sessions, we were supposed to go sing to the president. I was supposed to sing to President Bill Clinton. And I'm kind of grateful I didn't, but like basically we didn't have the money. I couldn't keep going and then I couldn't go on the trip. So everybody else went. I stayed home. Um, that happened a few times. And then shortly around that time, I don't know if this was before or after, but I think it was a little bit after, um, we were living in a trailer that my grandma owned, but my, she was letting my mom rent it. And that it is where I'm going to end the story for today. But basically I remember we had a turtle, we had a dog, we had a cat. And um, my new toy that I got from my best friend, we both traded our favorite toys to each other. Uh, I was at this, uh, my babysitter, uh, her name was Carmen. She was this Hispanic lady. I'm like, Andale! she'd always like be uh, keeping us in track, you know, keeping us in order. And uh, we traded toys there. And I got, I think I was on my way home. I don't remember if I was What was the home. toy? Uh, mine was a Power Ranger, the Red Power Ranger, and his was one of the gargoyles. You remember that gargoyle? Oh, I love Disney's gargoyles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Goliath, probably the mm -hmm. main, the main character one. Yeah, yeah. He, I don't, I don't remember, but he looked pretty cool. And as a kid, I was like, "This is my dude." You know yep. what I'm saying? So he was in the freaking fire, and I remember just looking at that fire ablaze. My pets were in there, my toys were in there, all my shit, and I just ran. <laughs> ran as fast as I could. And I remember a fireman grabbed me and be like, yo, you stupid little kid, get the fuck back here. Why are you doing that? And I was like, my, oh, my toys, you know, my stuff, my pets. And I, he, he's basically like, dude, it's on fire. I'm not going in there. You can't go in there. Like, basically, we're going to try to put it out. They couldn't put it out. Um, my turtle died. <clears throat> I, I'm actually pretty sure my dog survived, but she missed it. She lost an eye. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I, you know, I was a kid, so yeah. these details might be lost on me, but all I remember is that our VCR made it. <laughs> so of all the things, the VCR survived. Yeah, straight up. I love that because we used that shit for years. Like I said, you know, we got to keep what we got. <laughs> so yeah. the cool thing was the community was really nice. Um, we did get some donations. My mom was the weather girl and she was on the news and she was also later the big reporter in town for crime reporting. So in a way, my mom was kind of famous when I was growing up. She always had this like low key, like she'd go to the grocery store. Oh, you're Tara. You know what I'm saying? And it was kind of interesting. Um, so that was cool. And we did get some support from that. I remember my teacher, Miss Salvador, she dressed up. At, we moved to an apartment and she dressed up as a uh, like scarfs around her face she had a hat on big glasses it was like 8 p.m so it was dark it was like december my trailer burned down in december before christmas that's so the fireman gave me a rudolph toy and then my teacher came to give my mom an envelope at which point i saw what it was i knew that was miss salvador even though she hit her face and then i asked mom what happened and she said this nice mystery person just gave us money so we will have a christmas this year and, you know, that was really beautiful because like my life has always been like this to where it's like, you get this good. Okay. You just got into the choir. Oh, you're too broke. Can't go. Okay. You get this good. You get, got things going on for you. One of the smartest kids in the class. Okay. Now your fucking house burned down. <laughs> now you have nothing, no baby pictures. Um, you're basically just another kid with nothing. A big roller coaster of highs and lows. And, you know, from what you've shared with me, you know, it probably hit you a lot harder because, you know, growing up the way that you did, like losing something like that, probably just, I can't even imagine what that's, you know, felt like in that age. I'll be honest, man. Um, went numb, really stopped feeling. I didn't hug my mom after that a lot. I started like being weird about being touched. Um, I didn't want to talk to people. I really isolated. I started drawing pictures, but I wouldn't show anybody because I didn't want them to judge me. I just really still started feeling like helpless, I think. So I started controlling things by like just, um, I don't know, creation and escape, video games, um, drawing, 
I really just enjoyed not being in my life, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, I didn't really feel bad about it. I was just like, this is life and it sucks. I guess this is what I'm here to do. Well, it sounds like it, it hurt enough that you stopped manifesting your beauty. Like you didn't, you weren't drawing, you know, it sounds like you weren't really, I mean, obviously the choir thing didn't work out, but you didn't look for other ways to sing. Or no, other yeah. The singing that... thing kind of got lost for a long time. That was the devil working in like, Oh, there's his gift. And God was like, here, I got you. And then the devil's like, no, you're too broke. You can't, yeah. you can't do that. You should probably draw or something or go get a job, you know? So I'll, I'll end my story there for today. And, you know, I think we talked about qu quite a bit of little childhood trauma. We got the mom getting beat. We got the, you know, the grew up Christian grandpa controlling with the religion. We got the, I'm the father figure for the kids. You know, we got, I was bullied. My fucking, we were broke. We, uh, you know, our, our, I was kicked out of choir for being broke <laughs> and, trailer up in flames yeah and ultimately how each of those moments can lay the groundwork for you know like you said like going numb shutting yourself off going into your escapisms yeah and you know now the basically question what i believe we're getting into is like how those follow you mm -hmm. yeah you know? yeah how they how they shaped us and that's that's kind of what we we'll get to part three is definitely the how does childhood trauma can shape you you yeah. know what i'm saying and uh, for me, I don't, you know, I don't want this to become a podcast where I'm trying to be super educational or super self helpy. I want it to just be an identification. Okay. Yeah. You identify yourself, you yeah. identify Witness your bad yourself. behaviors, you identify the places that you're in the soil that you're in, because you're not going to unlock yourself without a huge amount of self awareness and a huge amount of empathy, forgiveness for yourself, for your situations, for your family, um, for the people that hurt you specifically. Um, so I think for me, like effects effects, how do you discover like what fucked you up? You start looking at things that are currently in your life. Like for me, I had relationship issues. I had attachment issues. I didn't, I had an anxious attachment specifically, which is where, um, you're a fear of being abandoned. Basically everywhere in life, you get something and it goes away. Uh, you never get to have anything. And anytime you love something and it leaves you. And it basically developed in me this deep anxious attachment disorder. Um, that went along with my generalized anxiety and my PTSD. <laughs> so as a kid, I got a whole handful of mental problems, which I didn't really understand. Um, I was never really depressed, but I, I think I did have like bouts with depression. I actually did kill myself in the future. We'll get into that in another um, episode, but it developed this need to control. And that's what actually suicide was for me. It was a need to control. Like, you can't fucking make me live this shit life. I will kill myself. And, you know, I've, I've, I've done that. And, um, these kind of behaviors are results of, you know, abandonment, neglect, abuse, whether it's direct or indirect, people don't realize how, how much it affects you being a kid, you might th be 25 years old feeling like, no, nah, I got over that shit. I got molested at four years old. I feel pretty good. It doesn't bother me. But then you're having relationship issues. You yeah. Know? Uh, sometimes when we get wounded, instead of allowing it to be seen, to air out, to really heal, we, we cover it up, we yeah. hide it and yeah. it starts stagnating under the skin. It. Yeah. We, we create these balls, uh, these walls, these barriers. And that's when we can tell ourselves, Oh, like, you know, this doesn't affect me. Like, Hey, yeah, this, whatever it happened. It was dark. It hurt me when I was young, but I'm, I'm good now. I'm grown. I'm look at all the on paper things I'm doing. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's never not there. Yeah, exactly. And like you, you get these behaviors. A lot of people don't realize that they self-sabotage. Um, they will literally fuck their own shit up, fuck up a job, fuck up a relationship, fuck up a, 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 a dinner, you know, because of trauma that they're not facing. And then they don't even realize that they may be the fucking bad guy in their story. And that's what's crazy to me. Um, you, and that's what develops this dislike for authority, rebellious tendencies. And not that these are bad things. Um, Have you felt like the bad guy in your story? Well, it's funny because I've always felt like the good guy, but I feel like they want me to be the bad guy. So I'm like, I'll be what you want. You want me to be the bad guy? Okay. I'll be the fucking bad guy. Okay. Yeah. And that's me. I'm like, truly, I'm the good guy trying to save the world. I am the Batman. I am the Spider-Man swinging, trying to save this girl. But all they saw was a weird dude in a red suit swing up and grab this chick. And they think I'm now trying to kidnap her. You know, it's like always weird shit like that. I have like literally fucking seven to 10 criminal cases where I was doing something totally different, not even doing anything wrong. Nine out of times out of 10, sometimes I was fucking up. Most of the time, not really. And then I'm told 
or the public is told I'm doing something completely different, which paints me in a completely different light, which basically gives everybody a version of me before they get to introduce to me, which makes me have to fight this version of myself that doesn't exist because it exists to them. And it fucks. Su it sucks, dude. It's been my whole life. That's how it is. Um, and that's because of all these traumas that I went through as a kid that I never really addressed. And uh, the reason I'm here now is because I've the last year of my life, I've gone through all my trauma at once. So it's Ooh, like, that's I, pretty heavy. Yeah. So I went through all my traumas as a kid, everything crazy that happened to me. And then at 32, I had like this spiritual moment where every bad trauma that could happen to me <laughs> happened again. The same traumas, just different people. Consolidated speed round traumas. Yeah. And I was like, yo, you're going to heal. You, you got to go on your mission. You didn't heal. We're going to put you back through it and you're going to have to figure it the fuck out. <laughs> and I, I feel good about it, though, because that's why I'm here is because I was pushed back in the fire and I pulled myself. Well, God pulled me out, but we'll get there. So the big thing is like identifying those behaviors that you have and then getting to the root of where you think they came from. Was it neglect from the parent? Was it physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, which is just as bad as physical abuse, you know? Yeah. Um, and how many of them repeated? You know, yeah. a big thing when we talk about is, you know, not just the ones that happened the once, but the ones that, you know, repeated in a certain repeated way. Drama, that, like, yeah. hey, like, you know, this repeated in my life when I was, you know, a child, a teenager, an adult. Sometimes these even repeat generationally. Like this happened to, you know, great, great grandfathers down to their sons, down to their daughters, down to then you. Facts. Yeah. And that gets to a good point. Um, there is this thing called generational trauma. Um, and I think that's the big key is that we have to look at it. This is why I'm looking at the family right now is because it's like, cool. So for example, my grandpa, he would, I'm not sure what happened to him. You know, maybe something happened to him where he was put in a position where he felt like he had to be Christian, uphold the family values. And that was his place. And, you know, more power to him, but he would physically be physical with, you know, my mom and myself and other people in the family. And then my mom made the choice. She's like, well, I don't want to be physical with my son. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be like that. And she tried, it didn't really work anyways. And, you know, I'm a big kid, you know, so she went the path of yelling. She's a little girl. I'm a big boy. You better stop your fucking shit. You know what I'm saying? And like, granted, that was a power thing. And it did scare the shit out of me and my brother. You know, when she got that voice, that shriek, I was like, oh, shit, I'm not playing games yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally yeah. saw you shriek in your chair. It sounds like one of those things that like lives in your spine. Yeah, you can hear it like, hey, I'm like, oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's a Sorry, response. Mom. Yeah, and that's a good thing, I guess. You know, to keep. But I don't. I feel like it's it's another thing. Like, okay, well, hitting doesn't work. I'm out of control. I gotta yell at them. And then, as a as a kid who grew up with a lot of yelling and breaking things in the house, I have PTSD, which means anytime somebody fucking yells, I get triggered, and then I get into this panicky fight or flight mode. So I don't like yelling, screaming, biting, fucking hitting, nothing. It's like with me, just talk. We can talk about this. You don't have to get crazy with me because I've been taught to get crazier than you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So just don't go there. Um, and that, that that's the thing, though, is like as, as as much as healing as she did to make sure that she didn't act in the same way as her father did to me, um, she had her own way that caused me PTSD. And that's not her fault. You know, we all have our issues and shit. Nobody showed her the way. And when I grew older, um, I had a baby at 30 years old my daughter, Aaliyah, and I decided I'm not going to yell at my kid. Now, granted, you have moments. You got to spank. You got to be like, stop, you know, but nine times out of 10, you're going to make that kid feel a lot better if you can communicate with them. And there is moments, there is some children, there is places that it's just not possible. And there's situations you have to find new ways to parent, which for me has usually been like, <sighs> explain what they're doing calm down, remove them from the situation that's exciting them, you know, and that'll be a whole other episode about like parenting and stuff. But yep. basically to, to what I've done is I've now taken the things where my mom allowed me to be free and grow and flow, you know, and grow into my self aesthetic. G I've been allowed to do that. And I took away the screaming. So now when I raise my daughter, I am able to bring her up and uplift the best parts of her without putting her down or yelling at her when she gets crazy, you know, and she's going to experience that with other people. I can't prevent that from happening, but it won't come from me. It sounds like having a daughter might have been a little bit of for you for your healing when you were a kid. Huge. That's kind of what I heard in that share of like, hey, these traumas that hurt me, like I now know it's like, well, not only do I not want them to pass to my daughter, 
it sounds like you're even inspired to heal yourself more so that those energies don't pass on her in a different way. A hundred percent. And I feel a hundred percent that my daughter was a part of my spiritual journey. Like, and the funny thing is when I dropped the album, Intelligent Design, I told you how these came to me way before this, way before my daughter was born. In 2019, my album, Intelligent Design dropped. And that was the year that I had my baby, which was the year that I was brought back to God. That was the year that I decided hold on, maybe all this universe shit, maybe all this God shit, maybe all this, all these things that are supposedly not the same are actually perfectly intertwined and a part of the same puzzle. And that was the beginning of my soul search. Um, because before that it was like a life search, right? Um, so I, I kind of do want to talk a little bit about the fact that in order to unplug or in order to plug into life, you have to unplug from escape. You have to unplug from the sheep mentality. You have to unplug from the hive and take control of your own life. Because what is the truth, man? We are born with an identity from the day we are born. You are a certain race. You are a certain religion. You are a certain culture. You're a certain nationality. You are a certain gender. And then as you grow up, they give you all these different genders, nationalities, things that you can become. And they yeah. never really, they never really let you have a chance to decide who you are yeah. the world tells you who you are and doesn't let you explore and discover yourself on your own and mm -hmm. that's you know probably the most important thing to do is children because that's the best time to do it you're the most free you have the most youth the most health the most ability to fail at that but still learn from it um i got a lot of messages of the reason the world tells you to do that is because so much there's so much like fear of failure there's so much fear of pain and maybe even going back to that trauma the world felt trauma and never healed from it ergo they're going do this so you don't have trauma which in turn on ironically makes more trauma yeah it's just like when you give people medicine for this and it gives you high blood pressure so you take some yeah, medicine for this instead of getting to the root of the fucking problem yeah that's very much western medicine in a nutshell like here's a drug to solve this symptom that may or may not cause other symptoms, but no matter what, we're not addressing the thing that caused the symptoms in the first place. Facts. And that's why we developed this podcast, Unlock the People, is because I want you guys to start taking control of your life, taking advantage of the situations you have, which is also the bad things in your life because everything is a blessing or a lesson. Um, don't be mad about the hard things in your life. Be grateful for them because you got to learn a lesson. You got to get stronger because how do you get strength, man? You get strength from challenge. You don't get strength from lying in your bed praying for it, bro. Like you have to literally get out there and fight. That brings us back to the the big being fans of Dragon Ball. There was an artist that I watch a lot who basically commented, Dragon Ball is a story of growth through struggle. That Absolutely. was the inspiration of why I like Dragon Ball a lot. Same yeah. idea. You you learn the most when in the fire, in the forge, and that's how you grow. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to part four, which is like the becoming uh, that, you know, like you said, with the Dragon Ball reference. OK, <laughs> excuse me. So when you become when you transform into Kaioken Super Saiyan, you know, when you get to that next level, when you unlock, whether it's by having your tail or by losing someone you love or whatever struggle that pushed you over the edge, and made you choose your side because sometimes you get pushed over the edge and you choose evil and you go out there and you hurt people because hurt people hurt people. Or sometimes you choose love because you don't want people to hurt like you hurt before. You don't want people to feel that way. So you heal because also healed people heal people. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly. And I think that's a big thing is like with this generational trauma comes generational healing. So just because you had a bad situation in life, just because it was hard on you doesn't mean that you have to pass that on. You can absolutely heal and do better. And I think that's what the world has to do, or we are choosing evil. If we don't choose to heal right now, we are neglecting good and we are choosing evil. So you have a choice. Choose to heal and do the right thing or you're fucking evil in my book. <laughs> yeah, And that's a big reason why I do like that we're doing this podcast is I very much agree with that statement. But I also witnessed that can be a very heavy burden to try and tempt alone, especially when you know there are responsibilities you have Facts. in the world. But, you know, even just simply talking about it, being open about it, you know, whether you share it with us and, you know, responses or you find your own friends and family members to share it with, the, the more we can connect with each other on our healing journeys, Absolutely. the less 
heavy it's going to feel, the less intimidating and hopefully manifest that. Man, I think change. the problem is everybody feels alone. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody feels like they're going through the struggle. Their ego tells them that you're having a harder life than everybody. Nobody has it as difficult. You don't got the opportunities. Your fucking, your family held you back. Your trauma held you back. Your skin color held you back. Your friends held you back. You know, it's like you ain't taking responsibility for the opportunities that you do have. And we live in a world where really there is opportunity everywhere. Sometimes in 99% of the time, you just have to fucking leave this situation you're in, right? Uh, if you're not growing where you're at, it's the soil. You know what I'm saying? You have to be replanted. You have to move. And I think that's a big part of becoming is getting away from what's hurting you. You know, even if it's your family, get the fuck out of there, go to a different yep. state, start over, be alone. Literally what I did. Yeah, that's what I did too. I love it. Um, so, you know, I want to talk about a little bit about the fact that mental ability stunts your brain um, at the age where you were traumatized, if it was like a big enough trauma. So say you're 13 years old, you got raped and it fucked you up and um, you chose to do drugs and drink and have sex to escape that pain. Uh, when you're 23, if you continue that for those 10 years, you are basically 13 years old at that age, um, at 23, 13 years old in a 23 year old body. So that means you're going to be responding to trauma and problems in real life. You're going to be responding to relationships. You're going to be responding to, uh, problems at your work as a 13 year old <laughs> and, but 30 year old problems should not be handled by a 13 year old person. And that's why I encourage everybody to heal because you know, something I found out when I was studying stuff about the CIA, where'd you find that? Well, the fact is when you're traumatized, it actually does something in our brains as humans that elevates us. It makes us stronger. Like I said, the challenge makes you stronger as long as you acknowledge the pain yeah. and heal. If you avoid the pain, if you mask the pain, if you, if you run away from your problems, if you act like you might not be the problem when you are, you're really just causing yourself more issues in the future and it's going to suck. Uh, but if you actually acknowledge that pain, and you heal and you try and you and you look and you don't give up and you and you have that faith you can actually become a stronger person a smarter person a brighter person and i i'm i'm, a, I'm proof of that because you know as much as i have natural abilities i've also been naturally degraded by life you know by jumping into these drugs alcohol video games and stuff and i'll be honest i feel like i have excelled because of my trauma as much as I've put off my blessings because I chose not to heal because I chose to escape. My blessings are still there for me and they're still going to come for me because what is yours is always yours, my friend. And I believe, you know, what it, God gives you is always going to be yours, but you have to choose it. You have free will. Um, that said, um, I, you know, I feel like I was sent here to walk through the fire with y'all so we can heal and unlock ourselves and each other. But you got to look at the facts, man, when you're being hurt, you have two choices. Uh, it's not, you're not the bad guy because somebody hurt you, but you really have to choose to become the good guy. Like I said, when this healing stuff, because every bad guy thinks they're the hero. Yep. You ever think about the, that? Yeah. I've heard that a lot where they'll say like the most interesting villains are that because they believe they are the hero of their own story. Bro, look at Hitler. Yep. Hitler like, thought he was the hero. Yeah. It's like they, they view themselves as I'm doing the right thing. I am leading everybody, but you know, the counter that is like, are they listening to the people around them? Are they listening to their own hurts, their own insides? Um, you know, like one thing I thought of as this talk is like, I almost feel like at the heart of all, you know, evils is a trauma of a very scared and lonely hurt child that right, never yeah. escaped so, that. Totally. And, you know, as a kid, I actually related and empathized with the bad guys a lot more. Yeah. Um, I would always, I'd always like the Joker. I liked yeah. Scarface. I liked all the bad guys. But one thing, going back to Dragon Ball, that's funny. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing I loved about Dragon Ball was that it was uh, all the fucking heroes, the main heroes, look at them. All bad guys. Well, every, va every fucking hero is a bad guy. Piccolo tried to take over the world. Yep. Vegeta tried to dominate the world. Killed his best friend in front of everybody. Yep. Became a good guy. You know what I'm saying? Um, Goku has a trend of going on journeys because Goku is the exception. He's a you know, flat character. But yeah, he goes on his adventure. He finds the bad guy beats them and through his like charismatic nature like turns them into a turns good them guy. good so, and yeah. that's how i feel i relate to goku yep. in that way yep. you know what i'm saying i want to take you bad motherfuckers who relate to me in the sense that i did and we can turn you good i guarantee it i believe it you know yeah so um you know i want people to realize like it's never too late like i started going against the grain 
pretty much as a teenager and i started my path that way and you yeah, you didn't start I, yours until 30 literally last year um yeah we'll we'll get into most of the details in a future podcast but the, the short form is i lived like when we were talking about being installed with a way to live mm -hmm. i lived that way basically right up until last year um whereas like listening to the world around me what i should be and not exploring my my gift of spirit you know what was i what was my gift since the beginning that I never like gave a chance or listened to or enjoyed of myself? And, and what was your heart song like? Uh, right now, it is the song of the adventuring storyteller. That's why I chose the name Sinbad because uh, very quick anecdote: the story of Sinbad is very simple. Merchant sailor goes on a bunch of adventures, come back to live this sell the sale. So an adventuring storyteller. Mm -hmm. And when I was in a very deep uh, ceremony that of self-reflection and listen to my soul about that. I was like, you know, I have, I love, I, I just looked at my history. We, we were talking, sharing games and things of child. Like when I was a kid, my favorite games, my favorite characters, they're always adventurers. Yeah. And I listened to that like innocent child of like, I was always drawn to these things, but I never like considered being one myself. And then when I was reflecting, it's like, you know, I, I remember the story of Sinbad. And then that was it. It just like snapped into place of, oh, I need to do something with this. You know, I feel that, and that'll get me to the next point is, uh, you know, I actually unplugged from my gaming and plugged into life because I was like, bro, I completed Grand Theft Auto 3 Vice City and San Andreas 100% and I collected every Pokemon. What the fuck did this do for me? Mm. I'm still broke. I still have not accomplished my goals. And then I unplugged that and I plugged into my life and <laughs> manifested every dream. I worked with some of my favorite artists. I've built tours with people like Afro Man and Project Pat, you know, Lil White freaking artists do or die artists that i grew up listening to and then artists that are popping up today like bez believe you know and i signed haystack to my record label and like and big v from nafgy roots like i've done some crazy things and it, it's it's also because and this is what i think the next call to action is going to be this is the ending of the podcast part five is where we ask you to take the information we gave you and kind of reflect on it right yeah a call to action distill a little bit what we talked about today mm -hmm. and i feel like um for me and Sinbad, I think you might notice something from both of us. My name is Derek Jensen. I grew into Static, who grew into Static G, who was later killed and raised to be Static Jesus. And that's Jesus with a G, by the way. But that alter ego is what carried me. It was my strength. It was my courage. When Derek Jensen didn't want to sing, Static G got the fuck up and did it. And when Derek Jensen was Static G scared, he just started drinking a little bit. You know what I'm saying? He really found a way to activate that side. And I, I will say like, I think that is what everybody kind of has to do for themselves is have your normal human form, the form you were born as, right? And then you got to have your alter ego, which is the, the shield, the power, the strength that will do it. It's your static G. It's your Sinbad. And then along the way, when you fucking discover it, you pick your divinity. And that's where, you're, that's where your goal is. You have your alter ego to get you through the fire. This gets you through hell. It's your ego. Ego to me is the devil. Your soul is God. So when you get through the fire and you kill your ego, I killed static G. I allowed him to die. So I could raise static Jesus and tap into this divinity. And we'll get into a lot more of the um, the uh, how to connect with God. Yeah, the different to... paths. Because even I would say, like, my path was a little bit different than what you shared. Like, so for me, it wasn't so much an alternate ego. It was, or it's, this is the ego I, I should have, or the person I should have been all along. Right. Like, I don't, like, have a different. But you can't. My thing is, though, that you can't. You ain't born that. So you have to create it yourself. You do have to go through the process of creating and manifesting yourself. But like we said, like you had a gift from spirit from the beginning mm -hmm. and you craft that as opposed to having it installed for you. Right. So um, for me, it's like a human thing, right? We have our human born and yeah. there's this path to divinity. And it's for me, that's why I'm using my terms and names to kind of you guys figure out your own. But there's Derek Jensen, the human as I was born as told to be the white Christian boy from middle of Wyoming probably should never be a rapper <laughs> you know yeah, what i'm saying but you challenged that i challenged that and became static g yes. who i feel like i am the rebel also the rebel of love the rebel of good the rebel that's supposed to, supposed to bring the light back to the dark world you know what i'm saying and that allowed me to ascend into my divinity which is the light bringer the yeah. healer walking the journey to unlock yourself and see who you've been this whole time or who mm -hmm. you have meant to be exactly and i think that until people can do that because like you had to say i'm the traveler i had to say i'm the music you yep. know what i'm saying so you have to identify what that is to you what is who 
are you? Yep. And what is that person's name? Yeah. What is that identity? And because it, now you get to decide. Yeah. And it comes from here. It comes from your heart song. It has to be. If you're going to fake it till you make it, you're going to get really good at faking. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't mind like the term, like fake it till you make it here and there to get through the door. But like, really don't fake it till you make it. Cause you're literally just going to be a fake person 40 years later and be like, fuck, I still don't feel good. Yeah. In fact, I feel worse because I, I wasted 40 years as this fake version of myself. Which, wearing a mask because it was convenient for other people absolutely and make it convenient for you because at the end of the day your soul is bound to a body you know what i'm saying and these bodies absorb energy and those energies with emotions can be like anger happiness joy sadness disassociation anxiety you know you can have all these feelings and to me these feelings will weigh you down and trap your soul in reincarnation and possibly into hell, heaven, wherever yep. you're attracted, because energy cannot be created or destroyed. We're in a situation where we have this law of attraction, but nobody wants to believe in heaven or hell, not even within themselves or in different realms and dimensions that they've never been in. They're so stuck in this physical earth realm that they can't grasp the fact that they don't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah, but I think we are starting to get into uh, things of future podcasts. Exactly. And that's why I want to end this podcast to let people know that, you know, it's not easy to grow. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. You're going to have to face the person in the mirror. You're going to have to face the people who hurt you. You're going to have to forgive them. Forgive yourself. Growth is uncomfortable. Healing hurts. Stop avoiding the work. It's your time. And this is your sign. Yeah. It's time to unlock the people. Yeah. Let's start by first loving yourself so we can unlock ourselves. That's right. This has been the first podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll definitely be coming through with multiple episodes going over my story, tapping in with Sinbad. And we'd like to definitely get you guys involved in future episodes and podcasts. So if you like this, please follow us, subscribe and let us know what you'd like to hear from us or maybe what give us some uh, more information about what you liked about this podcast and what you'd like to see more in the future of. All right, I'll have a wonderful evening. We out. Yes, sir. God bless. <laughs>